Kia ora to everyone um, who has both joined here and is uh, on the live stream. Uh, the couple of people who turned up not knowing that the event uh, had been cancelled are very well spaced out uh, in the auditorium to make sure that there is no risk uh, of anything going down here. But for everyone who wasn't able to join us, welcome to the live stream. Um, no Africa kite tonga aho, e tipu ake aho, i au tautahi, i ihunuku aho, i ki aotearoa, i te tau ruamanu mawaru, ko Daniel Taku uh, Very nice to meet most of you, um, and welcome to the live stream. So today what we're going to be doing is going over the different speaker positions um, and the different roles that people have within the debates. And we'll be doing it a lot through the lens of what we learned last week. Um, so what we learned last week is when you are setting up a debate, you want to look at two things. You want to ask yourself, what is the comparative? And then you want to ask yourself, what is the framework by which I win this debate? So we did a lot of prep exercises last time. And I actually think this is really exactly what you want to be practicing when you practice debating. Getting good at figuring out those two different things just makes your debating so much better. Um, but before we go over a recap of what we covered last week uh, and also start looking at how different speakers operate and the roles within a debate, I want to talk uh, just a little bit about some of the some of the background to debating. And that's not just the theory, uh, it's not just how people engage with debating uh, in general, uh, it's also about what it means to be a part of the debating community uh, and also to put a lot of your life and your energy into debating as an activity. Because while debating I, I think is incredibly excellent uh, and really lovely and you will all enjoy your time in debating, uh, I'm sure, and you'll be able to be a part of really good high quality debates uh, that make you both satisfied intellectually but also mean you have a, a common base from which to make friends, I think a very underrated part of debating is the fact that you are faced with disappointment a lot. You won't break at tournaments, you'll lose at debates, arguments that you thought were really good, everyone in your team won't like them and that you won't be allowed to run them and then you'll lose uh, even though they were excellent arguments that they really should have listened to you about. You're going to be faced with disappointment uh, a lot through your debating career. And one of the best things about debating is it makes you really insecure, it makes you very vulnerable, and then it gives you very structured ways to improve and to think about what it means to improve. So the values that you get in debating, doing it again and again and again, and it doesn't particularly matter if you win or lose, as long as you develop those skills in the long term, despite the disappointment, uh, I think are skills that are, and basically an attitude that people should bring into not just debating, but into all of the different parts uh, of their lives. One of the things that I'm going to add uh, particularly uh, is if you have questions, make sure you hop on to the, uh, the live stream, flip through a question. I won't really be taking questions from the audience because obviously you won't hear them. They'll be commenting along uh, and then when you do have questions, I'll be able to answer them. So for example, uh, I can see that two beautiful people have uh, entered comments um, and are saying hello. Uh, okay, so what we're going to do now, going to jump into what we did last session, just do a recap of what it means to set up a comparative and set up a framework when you are in that prep environment. Uh, and when we did talk about the prep environment, two things were really key. One is making sure you have that brainstorm time where you're just all quiet and you come up with the different questions you have about the debate and also some of your initial thoughts. And then you make sure that one person, when you're all sharing your thoughts, is taking down those ideas and can start forming them together. Uh, and then the second thing that was key is that the thing that makes debating different to, for example, writing an essay or writing a speech is the fact that you're part of a team. So it's a really collaborative process where luckily, if you know nothing about a topic, say for example, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, one of your teammates will swoop in and be like, I wrote my thesis on this and therefore uh, we're away laughing. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm just going to grab the laptop and I'm gonna bring it over to what we did last week, which beautifully says comparative and framework. And sorry, my camera work is incredibly shoddy. Um, so the comparative and framework to go over what those terms mean again, let me just reattach my, my plug here. Your comparative is essentially the two things that you're comparing within the debate. Uh, so for example, you might have a motion like this house would bail out the airlines and you won't be one side It's very very they need to do they need to like bail out the airlines But on the other side it actually isn't incredibly clear what the negative team is going to stand for They don't just need to stand for doing nothing. They can bring other things into that world They can say we won't bail out but we'll do this thing that is roughly comparable to it uh, That's a different option, but we think is a better suited option 
it is so frequent that teams will lose because they haven't really thought about what the other team is going to bring as their comparative. And they're going to be like, oh, you're just going to let these uh, industries fail with zero support, zero help. When in fact, you can be like, no, I'm going to support them this way, this way, this way, and this way. I just don't want to give them billions of dollars with very unclear outcomes. So making sure you understand the opponent's uh, point of view, the best case scenario for the opponent in terms of what they can set up in the debate is key to understanding the comparative and being able to make those arguments. The second thing that I'd say is it's really important to understand your own comparative because when you're setting up the debate, you want to be very clear about what you stand for. How are you bailing out the airlines? What are you going to be doing? Because obviously within debating motions, often there's a lot of vagueness. The phrase bail out the airlines includes lots of different potential pathways that have very different outcomes. So in, when you're setting up a debate and you're discussing it as a team, you want to be very clear about what you stand for and then be very clear about what you think they're likely to stand for, taking a rather generous interpretation of what they're going to stand for. And of course, you have a bit of conflict within the comparative. If they try to set up something that just doesn't make sense, you can push them on that or say, no, that's not your burden within the debate uh, and, and try and shift the grounds of the debate. But the entire debate operates on that idea of the comparative. And that's also necessarily how your points should flow. You shouldn't just explain why it's good to bail out the airlines. You should be explaining why it is better to bail out the airlines than any of the other alternatives that might be offered. Because nothing in the debating happens in the abstract. It's always comparing two different things. So when I'm prepping, first thing I do is set up the comparative, make sure I'm really clear what the world looks like. Then the second thing that I think about is the framework. And the framework is essentially, what do we need to do to win the debate? You ask, what is important to me? How does this person think? How do I, how, well, what principled frameworks do I operate in? And once you go through the framework, it's often really easy to figure out your case. Because you might say, well, I really care about people having their jobs. Uh, I really care about making sure that airlines operate because it's good for our economy. Uh, I really care about the New Zealand's international image. And as soon as you start writing down the things that you care about in relation to this particular thing, you start being able to see not just your own arguments, but the arguments that are likely to be brought by the other side. So equally with, uh, equally with the framework as with the comparative, what you're trying to do is not just think about the case that you want to bring, but how do you think the opposition is going to be bringing out their ideas? And this is one of the big step changes you'll make in debating. You'll stop just thinking about, okay, what am I proposing? How do I walk through it? And you'll start thinking, well, what are the reasonable alternatives? How am I comparing the two different things? How are my arguments always phrased uh, in that way of being able to bring additional additional benefits? Um, how am I able to counter the likely arguments coming from the opposition? And that just makes you a better quality debater. And in your general life, it'll make you much better at seeing the broader holistic issue rather than the specific narrow vision uh, that you want to bring out of it. Any questions? Do, 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 do. Okay, one question uh, is, what do you do when your opposing team runs a weird model? Well, hopefully you win, right? Because running a weird model is something that is generally not advisable and will often allow you to outflank them. There are two questions you probably have to ask when the opposing team runs something that you, don't, that you think is quite weird. The first question, which is essentially what you should be doing in any debate, is what is the weaknesses of this weird model? Because often when they set up something weird, Often it's because they haven't really thought it through and they haven't been able to identify it. So for, say the example uh, was about bailing airlines and the F team stands up and says, yes, what we want to do is we want to give billions of dollars to the CEO to make sure that the company survives uh, and not really bail out any of the employees. You might be like, hmm, that sounds really weird. Um, and it's actually massively flawed because now you're giving lots of money to the CEOs while allowing a lot of people to lose their jobs and that creates these uh, harms that they didn't think about. So your first question is always, how has this decision that they've made likely to hurt them? How does it operate? How am I able to make this into a harm or a benefit? The second question you can ask is whether or not it is in the spirit of the motion or whether it's in line with the words of the motion. So say, for example, they want to legalize, the motion is legalize all drugs, and your affirming team stands up and says, ah, oh, yes, we really want to legalize marijuana and just marijuana. You can then take the words of the motion as an opposing team and be like, hey, what you have to stand for in this debate is the legalization 
of all drugs, we do not think the legalization of marijuana fits within that burden. Because what happens when two teams are contesting the, the model is often they're contesting what the motion means. And while the affirming team can come out with something that they think reasonably fulfills the words of the motion, so I, for example, in an legalized all drugs debate, uh, I'm happy to limit it to like recreational drugs. We're not gonna be legalizing potentially things like performance enhancing drugs. We're not gonna be legalizing things uh, like, like medicines that aren't particularly effective and give people heart defects. What we're talking about really is recreational drugs. I think that's probably a reasonable limitation. But if you say it's just marijuana, if I'm on the opposing team, I can stand and be like, no, that doesn't fulfill your burden within this debate. This is all drugs. And the fact that you're unable to come up with any justification for the legalization of heroin probably means we're going to win this debate. Often when teams set up weird models, it's because they're afraid of what happens if they embrace the full model. So point that out. The judge really likes that. Any other questions? Nope. Do, do, do. What we're going to do uh, is jump now into the, the body of, of our main uh, presentation, which is about the different roles that people have. And once again, I'm going to take you on a magical carpet ride um, to the gorgeous little diagram I drew, incredibly simple, of how speakers speak in a 3v3 debate. So you've got your first affirming speaker. They set up the debate. First negative speaker, they set up their case. Second affirming, they continue. Second neg, third F third neg, and then we swap the replies. So the, the re negative reply speaks right after the third negative speaker, um, and the affirming reply speaks right off, uh, sp speaks after, once well, sorry, speaks after um, the neg reply. Um, and that just means that both teams have like a good chance to be heard, uh, a good chance to be understood. So what we're going to do is go through each of those different speaker positions. I'm going to explain to you the commonalities between across both the first app and the first neg, uh, so on both sides. And then I'm going to explain some of the slight differences between if you're, for example, a second affirming and a second neg, how sometimes there is this change in the way you need to approach the debate uh, in order to maximize your impact on it. OK, so we'll start at the very beginning with your first affirming, um, uh, well, just your first speakers in general. Uh, what flows very naturally from having a prep session uh, and coming up with the case, often the case that you generate should basically be word for word what your first speaker uh, like says. So what they need to do is A, set up the debate. So often they'll be need to explain the model, explain the comparative, be very clear about the two things that you're comparing with in the debate. And then often their first substantive point, by substantive point we mean like I have one point, two point, three point, those are, those are substantive points contrasted with rebuttal, which is just directly responsive material. Their first point I advise often to be your framework. So in your first point, you want to tell me what you care about in the debate. Uh, and so for example, if it's a debate about privacy and you're on the first affirming team, your first point is going to be the principle of privacy. Why do we care about privacy? What are we weighing up within this debate? If you have that set up as a first speaker, firstly, what you stand for, the comparative and the model, and then your first real point, your first substantive point being the framework you identify within the debate, it really anchors the rest of the case. Because it means that when the judge is deciding whether your team wins or their team wins, they have like a roadmap to coming to that decision. I think the team that is able to the win is the team that convinces me that they'll have less unemployment, less people who are destitute, uh, and a more healthy recovery. And if your first point is about why I should care most about economic recovery and employment, it really sets the stage for those following points. Then what happens is the rest of the substantive points, uh, points two, points three, sometimes points four, but I counsel against that. And what those do is essentially try and achieve what you've set out in your setup of the debate and explain why it's going to happen. Uh, so there are often mechanism points why we're likely to have better employment, why we're likely to have a faster economic recovery that then very clearly flow into that first point. Everyone understand how, you, how a first speech basically operates. Make it very clear what we're debating about and then advance the baseline case for achieving that. Neat. So there's a little bit of difference here between the first affirming team and the first negating team. But I think first is actually the position where it is most parallel uh, in terms of what you're doing. Because both teams, uh, both, both first speakers, they're going to be want to be contesting the comparative, making sure that the debate shifts onto favorable grounds from them, make it very clear what we're talking about, setting up the debate properly. But then often what will happen is you'll have mirror points. So if, for example, you care about the same things within the debate, but you just think that they'll come across differently, say, for example, the debate is about legalizing all drugs, uh, and both teams really care about people dying of drug overdoses, which is like a very reasonable thing for everyone to care about. 
both teams will say, hey, we care about drug overdoses, so you'll be able to do that very, very quickly. And then the next thing you do is go through, okay, how do we get less drug overdoses? And so often first speakers won't necessarily have an explicit rebuttal section because one speaker, the first half will be like, I think you get less drug overdoses for these reasons. And then the second will have a mirror point or a parallel point, which is just saying, well, I think there's going to be more drug overdoses for these reasons. And often the rebuttal will be contained within those points because you want to be challenging the conclusion there so you don't need your own rebuttal section. However, sometimes the first negating speaker will have a rebuttal section. And the reason for this is sometimes those cases don't have that lovely mirror effect because you care about different things or the cases just operate where one thing will probably happen on one side, which is bad, and one thing that will happen on the other side, which is bad. And both teams are trying to point those bad things out and make them seem like they're bigger. So there's a trade off there. If that is the case, and you are the first negating speaker, you want to have a rebuttal section just to make sure that you very clearly attack the points that have come out from the first affirming speaker. And that'll generally come between your setup. So your setup is where you tell me what you care about, what exactly you stand for. So that comparative framework that we are talking about, but before you get into your own point. So it's basically a way of saying, they told you that this dreadful thing happens on our side. It's not true for one, two, three reasons. What we really want this debate to be about, what we really care about is the rest of my case. Uh, and then you dive into those points. So those are how the two first speakers operate. Does anyone have any questions on how that works? Okay, cool question. How long should a first AF usually spend on setup compared to a first neg? Um, so I think this is a good question. Unfortunately, it is a little bit debate specific. If you are, and I often think it relies um, on how predictable the, the case is going to be. So if you're at first AF, and you're not entirely sure what this, the first neg or what the neg case is going to be, you want to be making sure that you very clearly set up the debate, say exactly what you stand for, and then very clearly set up why the things that you care about are the most important. Uh, and then the second will just have to respond and deal with it. But what I would say is that sometimes people on first neg take too much of a straight approach. They're like, no, setting up the debate is all the responsibility of the first affirming speaker. Uh, so I'm just going to accept whatever they say and then bring out my points. I would push against that. You have just as much a role on the first neg in setting up the debate as the first AF, because you're going to be pushing your own comparative and you're going to be pushing your own framework. So that setup kind of has to come from both teams because it anchors the rest of your cases going down. Okay, neat. What we'll do now is we'll just move to talking about second speakers, which is the best speaker position to be in. Uh, so I hope all of you um, have had a chance to talk about uh, and do second. Uh, and one of the reasons why it's so cool is it's probably the, the speaker position where there's the biggest gap between the two uh, between the two worlds uh, that that I'm sorry the two roles that the different speakers have to have. Okay, so if you're a second affirming speaker, your major role is to shape the debate and respond to what has come out at the first neg speaker. Because remember, the first neg speaker is a, is a first response position because they're the first time you've heard the affirming case and they're the first people who get to respond to it. But the first response speaker on the affirming team isn't their first speaker like in the neg speech, it's actually their second speaker because that's the first time you really hear what the negating case is. And so you've got a lot more of the role to bear that first hit and to, and to do all that, that frontline rebuttal. So if you're a second speaker on the affirming team, you need to have more of a rebuttal section, uh, like a clear rebuttal section, just to go through point by point and make sure you have all those clear, clear bits to respond to. If you contrast this with a second neg speaker, speaker this, that, that role is much more about shaping the debate and it's probably a little bit more similar to what a third speaker does. So by that stage, it's probably quite clear where the debate is going because you've had a first F speak, a first neg speak, and then a second F speak. So you've had, everyone's had a chance at least to respond to each other a little bit. At that stage, what you're doing is being like, okay, these are the three things in the debate we care about. Here's how I achieve them. Um, and of course, you do that to some degree on the on the first, uh, sorry, on the second affirming uh, uh, side, because you also want to shape the debate in a particular direction. And really, the way I think about it is seconds are like your pivot speakers. So if you've been disastrous at first, you've really chosen the wrong case, that's the opportunity to shift the debate in the direction that you want to. Um, and that's what you really need to be doing. So if we go very clearly on how you structure those speeches, you have your introduction just like everyone else. What I then like to do is have a foundation section. And essentially, what I look at there is particularly the comparative, the framework, and then something I call context, which is basically like a rebuttal point, but a little bit different. So 
if the opposition has misidentified the comparative, the first thing you do is going to be like, okay, I'm going to clarify the comparative because they seem to think we stand for this, but we've been very clear we stand for this. If it's framework, what I'll do is be like, the reason why what you should care about in this debate is these points, they've wanted to advance this framework, I think our framework is better for these reasons. And then context is just if they've missed a really massive point in the debate, and you want to make sure that it is recognized. So for example, they've given a huge speech about Southeast Asia, and they never mentioned the role of China. And if you talk about the role of China, all of their points collapse. It can be really efficient in your speech to just have a little bit of context and be like, we have one point, why China affects things that takes out a lot of their points, now jumping to why all my points. So sometimes you, you, you can put it up as a context point, like a really good bit of rebuttal, uh, and then you can take out a lot of their ideas. So you have your introduction, you have your foundations or, or like setup section, uh, and then you have what I call like issues or questions, and it's kind of like points of clash. So points of clash, I'll talk more about those when talking specifically about the third speakers, but what points of clash are is essentially saying, what are the issues in the debate that lead you to either win or lose. So what do we care about most within the debate? And then what happens following those things? And it'll be different for every debate how you set up those points of clash, but you want to be able, if you read through your points of clash, have the answer, I need to win this debate. If this thing is true, this thing is true, and this thing is true, I win the debate. So that, that's like, I think, a clear way to set up, uh, to set up how, those, how those points of clash work. Cool, question. Is there any difference between framing in one gov in BP and one F? Or is it basically the same? Okay, so this is a question particularly about the difference between 3v3 uh, and, and British parliamentarian, which is the style that we'll do in the second semester. I think the major thing to focus on in, in uh, 3v3 is you know you're never going to be outflanked by later teams coming after you. So you can choose a more narrow case. You're not necessarily trying to block everyone out of the debate. You just need to do what's efficient for you. So there's just a little bit of strategy. 3v3 is just a bit more simple, um, but that's a very good question. Um, yeah, okay, cool. So those are how the two seconds operate, jumping down to the thirds. The thirds are basically, you just take the issue second section in a second speech and make it the whole speech. So your speaker will stand up and give you a nice and short introduction, and then they'll be like, I have three points of clash or three issues that I want to talk about. Uh, say, for example, the debate is about banning drugs. They might say, I have three points of clash on the affirming, firstly, whether or not it is principally just to deny people the ability to choose to take drugs. So if, they, if we win that, we think we can win the debate because it doesn't matter if people are hurting themselves, we think people have a right to hurt themselves, therefore we should legalize all drugs. Then they could say my second point of clash is whether or not we decrease the overall rates of drug overdoses because they say we do, we say we don't, which team wins? And then third, they can be like, oh, what is the consequence of the war on drugs? Do we think we're likely to have more crime or less crime or something? And then they'll be taking the pulse of the debate, trying to take all of the different arguments that have risen within the debate and basically shape them and whip them at the end of the speech to make sure that, that they're winning the debate essentially. So the thirds are basically the finishers. They need to add the last bits of rebuttal that are necessary to win each issue your way or the other way. And then the judge will weigh up those particular issues to decide whether you've won uh, or lost the debate. Any questions about, and, and the third speakers essentially do the same job. Uh, one neat thing about third speakers is they're not allowed to bring any new substantive material. So for example, if we haven't really talked about the effect of, of crime and the war on drugs, as a third speaker, you can't be, you can't stand up and be like, I'm going to talk about the effect of crime on the war on drugs. So, so you're limited to essentially what is the, the grounds that the debate is already being fought on, uh, and then you operate, operate through that. Equally, one neat thing to add about the second speakers is that in addition to trying to respond to the other team, you can do two extra things. One, you can bring substantive material, which is basically like a new point. So say you wanted to bring that point of crime, you can do that. That's generally not necessary because your first speaker should have covered most of the important things already. And too many times second speakers get up and add something that isn't really that important within the debate. So if it's more efficient to just focus on the rest of the time, you don't need new extension material. But one thing they do need to do is bring up all of their first speaker's material. I often like to think of it as a second speaker's biggest job is to make their first speaker look good. So you want to be like, my first speaker was just exceptional. They told you three incredible things they responded barely to this one, not at all to this one, and very haphazardly to this one. These are why our points still stand within the debate. So you want to be like bolstering up your first speaker's points, making them important, making sure that they aren't forgotten within the debate, uh, and then going forward like that. Cool. Any questions about how seconds uh, and thirds operate? Okay, Umber asks, 
is there an easy way to figure out what your burden in the debate should be? So that's going back to the, um, the how you set up the debate, which is often the role that is done in your first speech. But remember, it is important also for the seconds and thirds and how they figure out what they need to do to win the debate. Um, so the way you figure out your burden in the debate, the rule of thumb that tends to be used is, is it within the spirit of the motion? Um, and what that particularly means is that the affirming team can set up a reasonable interpretation of the debate. And sometimes there'll be multiple reasonable interpretations because the motion will be vague. And so the, the adjudicator needs to accept it if it's reasonable. So as I gave you that example before about legalizing all drugs, I think it's broadly reasonable to limit it to recreational drugs and not medical drugs because they're very different issues uh, and it just confuses the debate to have both those things in the same one. But if the affirming team decides to choose something that isn't within the spirit of the motion, essentially isn't an interpretation that is reasonable to the judge, then you can challenge it as a second team, uh, as, as a dating team, and push against uh, that as not fulfilling their burden. And essentially, once you set up that burden, the way, the way you figure out, okay, how big is my burden, is just asking yourself, how much do I need to prove this to win? And you need to do that in the debate. You need to be like, if they prove this and I prove this, we still win for these reasons. It's just our burden to prove this within the debate. And if we win, if we prove that, uh, then we're able to win. Cool. Any questions about how burdens operate? This is probably the, the most where uh, debate is an art rather than a science. So there's a lot of like interplay there and pushing backwards and forwards about how you set up that burden. Uh, and often if you go to somewhere like Australia, looking 50% of the debate will just be about, oh, my burden is this, my burden is that, which is really boring. We don't do that much of it in New Zealand. But it's good to have that awareness is that you're playing a bigger game than just the issues, uh, the issues at play. Okay, another question. What's a good way to extend on material uh, the speaker before you brought out? So different for different types of speakers. Obviously, the extension role is the second and the third speakers. If you're a third speaker, you have a very limited role. You're not allowed to bring out new material. So the way in which you add to the debate is to respond to the ideas that have already been brought out. So you say, this is a big issue in the debate. Do we, are we able to get uh, less drug overdoses? We told you this, they told you this. Their version doesn't work for this reason, this reason, this reason, this reason. You just go through all of the reasons why their points don't stand within the debate. So only your points are left standing. Uh, and you can also respond to their responses. So they'll be like, your point was done for this reason. And you'll be like, no, no, no. Actually, that's correct. Your point is done for the same reason. So, so this, the, you're, you're defending your sandcastle while trying to whack down the other person's sandcastle. So those are how the thirds extend on the debate. The second really depends on the second speaker. There's something called uh, an outward extension and an inward extension. An outward extension is basically a new point in the debate. So say no one's mentioned crime, you as the second speaker stand at the end of your speech and be like, I'm going to add a new area to this debate, I'm going to talk about crime. So that is an outward extension. Then there's an inward extension, and I love doing inward extensions. Say, for example, you have a debate about whether or not it should be against the law to do X thing, uh, and you're trying to prove that there will be less people doing this thing because you make it illegal. Uh, and say your first speaker says the main reason why people won't do it is because people are afraid of being punished. Therefore, they're not going to be able to, um, like, people are going to stop doing this thing. You can be like, first issue is whether people are more or less likely to do this. My first speaker gave you one mechanism, deterrence. People don't want to be punished, therefore they won't engage in this behavior. And I'm going to add another mechanism. I'm going to say people are afraid of social stigma. They, they People like to obey laws uh, and therefore people are more likely to align themselves when you've got clear standards. So that's an example of an inward extension. We have the same goal as your first speaker. You want to achieve less people doing a bad thing. You just bring a new reason to do it, a new mechanism, which just adds a lot of nuance to your case. It means that they've got more stuff to respond to. So that was a very good question. Um, about how you are able to extend on the speakers. <laughs> um, so we've just had a prominent Australian debater, uh, world's finalist, robbed in the world's final uh, comment that I have a, I, I'm insulting their sophisticated understanding uh, of burdens. Burdens is probably the only sophisticated thing about Australian debating. Uh, so I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, I probably did insult, insult their, way, their way of speaking there. Um, okay, so that is how first, second, and third work. Any questions about that before I jump into the leader's replies, which like second to second speeches are probably the most fun, fun to give. Okay, the way I think about a leader's reply is I'm giving the speech I should have given when I spoke first. So it's taking all of the hindsight you have learned from the debate um, and setting out the framework or what you need to win the debate really clearly, and then just explaining from what has happened in the debate why you have won the debate. Um, and so what you do uh, is you be like, okay, there are three issues in this, just like your third speaker did. 
but you're not allowed to add any rebuttal. You say, we told you this, you're likely to get less drug overdoses. They then told you that no, because you have more drugs, you're likely to get more overdoses, but we win this point because we explain to you the role uh, of, of having access to treatment, of having access to medication, which is far more important than the overall quantity. So essentially what you're doing is summing up the debate and explaining why you've already won each of the different points. And once again, there's a bit of art here. You can push and stretch it, uh, stretch the points that you've already made. Uh, so say if you almost made a point, you can kind of just like pretend you've already made that point and hope the adjudicator thinks there was enough of that in that case uh, to credit it there. But it's some people think about it as a biased adjudication where you tell the adjudicator what they need to say and what they need to think in order uh, to hand you the victory. Um, and I have a huge authority uh, on these replies because the, the Australian who was commenting also gave me a 40 at Australis for my reply. So he really liked my reply. Um, so I'm, an, I'm, I'm clearly an authority on that. Any questions about how replies operate? No, so replies um, are a lot of fun. Um, and by the end of it, hopefully through this process, and this is why formal debating is quite cool, as the debate goes through the different speakers, you get different and deeper layers of nuance being added uh, uh, each time. Um, and, and one thing I, I would add is to come again, once again, to the earlier speakers, the first speakers, what you're trying to do as a first speaker is not necessarily create the end product in the debate. Um, you don't want that, you, do, you can't do anything in, a, in an eight or seven minute speech. What you're really trying to do is set a really strong foundation for the debate. So when I speak um, second with, with, with one of the first speakers who I often speak with, the uh, strategy that he will use is to bring out a, a lot of material. Um, and then what you do as a second speaker is to try and develop that material, add nuance to it, say, OK, this didn't really work. This did work. I'm going to pull it out a little bit more and develop it. But they need to set a really clear foundation. And then as a second speaker, it's your role to bring new additions to it uh, to develop it a bit more. Cool. Any other, any last questions uh, before we finish this, the first uh, inaugural development seminar? Flood, flood the mentions um, with, with questions uh, and we can, just, we can just have a chat now. Um, if anyone has any questions about other stuff, also keen to have a chat. Um, yeah. Any thoughts? Any thoughts from the crowd? Because obviously it may be a little bit of a lag time. Well, I came to lots of development sessions when I was when I was really young uh, and beautiful and first year. Um, so yeah, definitely come to lots of events. Obviously, there's a little bit of a a, a problem posed by the fact that there is a, a pandemic. Uh, so maybe you can't come physically to all of our events, but we'll be running these seminars weekly. Um, and also one thing that I find really helpful and will definitely if you flick me a message I'll give you more resources. It's actually quite useful to watch debates because only once you start watching uh, really high quality debates you not only begin to see like the, 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 the basic structures, the bones of those cases, but you have to be like, oh, this person has departed from that usual structure because it happens to suit that debate. And one of the things that, that shows like a really good speaker from a great speaker, or for example, a good high school speaker and a good university speaker, is not whether they can follow those basic structures and those basic ideas that I was talking about, but they know when to depart from it. They know how and when to stretch the different ideas um, that are coming through uh, and, and adapting it to the particular debate. Um, so if, if you want debates that you to watch, specifically for different speaker positions, flick me a message. There's a lot of very good debaters, a lot of very good Australian debaters uh, for the Australian viewers uh, who, who are shooting in today, um, who, are, who I'll give you um, as, as people to watch. Yeah. OK, so that's a good question. What he basically asked is whether the stuff I talked about was unique to New Zealand. Um, so the structure. Uh, of how the debate operates is common to a lot of countries. Uh, so the 3v3 style and the basic speaker positions that I've walked through are, are very familiar. And ob obviously there's, a, there's evolution and there's also a little bit of geographic difference. Uh, a good example of that, uh, specifically in role fulfillment, is some countries still put a lot of emphasis on your second speaker bringing out a new substantive point, so extending outwardly in some ways, where I think New Zealand has adjusted a little bit more towards the idea that what you need to do is develop the debate, but not have a, like, one clear substantive point uh, at the end of your speech. There's a little bit of a difference there. Um, and then some of the ways of thinking about this debate aren't necessarily um, 
New Zealand based. Some, to some degree, they're, they're a little bit me based. These are the things that I think about and different speakers in New Zealand will think about these issues slightly differently. They might have different words for comparative framework, different buzzwords that become popular in debating across the world uh, at different times. But I think this is the strategy that is best for giving you a broad perspective on what you need to achieve within the debate uh, and then making sure that you develop things further. And what we're probably going to do in the, sec in the next live stream seminar um, is talk about specifically how to develop points once you've already decided what those points are going to be. Because while I think it's the most important thing is to figure out which points to run, even if you're just like uh, uh, three points and then say the three correct points, um, you can also deepen them and develop them and structure those points internally in a much more sophisticated way. Um, and so we're going to be talking about that a lot uh, as things go on. Cool. Any other questions? So some judges have different perspectives. I know a lot of judges, especially if you're a first speaker, make sure you are setting up the debate really clearly. Because a lot of, if the debate becomes awful and messy and no one knows what they stand for, often they'll punish the first speaker specifically for, for doing that badly. Um, sometimes, so some of the stuff I was talking about is a little bit like what works and some of us some of what I was talking about is explicit rules. So the stuff that is rules, you're not allowed any new material in your leader's replies. So no new responses, no new material. You won't be penalized, but they won't really give you any credit. The same for third, no specific standard points. You're allowed to develop material. Um, you're allowed to respond to new things, but you're not allowed to really dive in and give a whole new substantive point. Those are rules. Uh, and then some of the other stuffs uh, it's more just what works. So I advise you follow the structures that I gave out. But sometimes like, it'll be really clear that everyone likes the same things. The debate is really clearly about how do we get less COVID-19 uh, spreading. Um, and then the debate is about not what that thing is, what, what our goal is, the debate's about how we get there. So in those debates, your foundation section will get much smaller because you don't really need to convince the judge that what we care about is decreasing infections. Rather, you just need to spend lots of time on your substantive points explaining how we achieve it. But then other times, teams will spend far too little time explaining why I should care about the things that they're talking about. And then at the end of the debate, I'll be like, wow, you really did convince me that there'd be less clowns. I just don't know why we want less clowns. Why is that something I should care about? Um, and so you can lose the debate that way. So that it, you need to really ask yourself, and that's what you do when you talk about comparative and framework, where is my opposition going to disagree with me? What are they going to be pushing back on? Because that's really where you need to devote most of your time in order to become uh, like a more efficient speaker. Neat, good question. Anyone else? Nope, anyone else from the live stream? If not, it was lovely to see you all. Um, we'll hopefully see you next week, potentially from the comfort of my dining room, um, as we are all quarantined in our in our little flats with our um, yeah. Everyone remain safe. Use use hand sanitizer. Um, self distance. Self distance. Don't come to debating events. That was criminally irresponsible of all of you. Um, and yeah, it's lovely to see you all. Uh, hope to see you next week.